What's going on, guys? It's Brian Jack with Simple Man's Comics, and we are back with another great episode of that Simple Man's Comics Friend podcast. So if you're not subscribed, you want the audio version, make sure you check it out. We're available wherever podcasts are found. We got a great episode tonight. We are going coast to coast with the stop in between at Texas. That's right. We have another great YouTube channel, Lords of the Long Box, on with us tonight, Timbo and Zach, a.k.a. Manimal. Welcome, guys. Great to have you on this episode. And for our viewers that may not be aware, tell us a little bit about your channel. What's up? Thank you first for uh, introducing me with my full government name since nobody knows. <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. People just call me Tim, Timbo, or a lot of people know me as Tivo from Lords of Lombox. Uh, I've been on YouTube since about 2015, been on Instagram for about 2012, talking comics. Uh, started, you know, just kind of talking comics and spec books and stuff like that and kind of kind of graduated into doing shows and talking about books and where to get books, the correct things, slabbing, pressing, all that stuff that collectors do. And uh, five years later, we're still going strong. I brought my man Manimal on. So uh, I'll let you guys, I'll let him introduce himself. Yep. For everyone who doesn't know, I'm Manimal. My real name is Zach. I guess we're talking about government names here, but you probably see me around on a couple different channels, currently residing with the Lords of the Long Box. I'm just uh, your collector's reader. I'm a big reader, read all the comics. Uh, an encyclopedia of information, and I just love talking to me some comics, man, drinking some beer, and that's my shit. Well, we're glad to have you guys on. We're going to put the topics up on the screen for this episode right now, but I also want to give a shout out to Tim because we're both representing the good old Washington Redskins. Hail, so baby, on. hail. There's always next year is our motto. <laughs> yes. Always next year. We've been saying it since 91. <laughs> Except not this year. Yeah. 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 I don't even know there'll be a year. That's this team once again, oh, baby. Oh, shit. <laughs> But you mentioned bringing your, your boy, Zach, a.k.a. Manimal, on. That's the first topic we want to get into. The, the, Zach, you'd mentioned being on a couple of YouTube channels before. You yeah. were known pretty much as, like, one of the hottest free agents on YouTube. Appreciate How it. did you and Tim meet up, connect, and then now you're a regular staple on the channel as well? Yeah, so, you know, I helped create a, another channel and was on there for a long time. I met Tim and the other lords through that, different things, and – um Tim and I had a bunch of interactions just in terms of YouTube videos and chatting comics, chatting off scene, whether it's on Instagram or Facebook and whatnot. And then honestly, kind of when I really got to know Tim, he's one of the few people in the industry, you know, you know, all these guys, but you actually never meet them. You know what I mean? So then Tim and I hooked up at WonderCon last year back in March and had a blast with a couple buddies, uh, killed it at WonderCon. And um, when I left my other channel, Tim was like, hey, want to pop on over, kind of be a substitute pitcher, if you will, why uh, Dark Side Jedi was out for a little bit and meshed well and just stuck around, man. Glad to be there. Glad that they gave me a place to, uh, you know, still kind of talk comics. Yeah, we brought, uh, so how it started was I needed somebody for the show. Uh, so I posted an ad on Craigslist, males <laughs> looking for males. And That's I it. got a bunch of weird pictures, man. <laughs> so I realized that was not the right place to do it. So, uh, yeah, so Zach and I, I had been on his channel. He had been on my channel. We would just talk. And then we finally hooked up at WonderCon. We just had a blast walking through the con floor, yeah. doing a live show after the fact. And then Dark Side Jedi had back surgery. So he's going to be gone for like two or three uh, months. You know, the history of the Lords of Longbox, there's probably been about 10 people that have been on the show since 2015. So this was the most current iteration with our friends were Three Men in the Basement, uh, uh, Nemesis Prime, and Otto from the Grotto. And then uh, Ryan was kind of in and out because, you know, he back surgery is brutal, man. You can't even sit there for an hour at a time. So Zach stepped in and then, you know, people liked it and people were like, we'll keep him. I think we'll keep him. You know what I mean? <laughs> He hasn't I left yet. So, you know, I tried to get him to do solo videos, but he, ha he doesn't want to do that quite yet. So we'll see. Well, I think it's been a great mix. Um, I also go by a tagline, of course, Mr. Bolo, uh, other than my government name, uh, <laughs> Jack DeMeo. So I definitely can relate to you guys as well. But, you know, I think that the addition of Manimal to the Lords of the Long Box has been really key. I'm a longtime Lords fan, um, but I'm also a Manimal fan. So I, 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 used to watch it, him. I used to watch you on your old channel. I'd watch your stuff with New Comic Book Day. I've always thought you have great insights on like reader buzz and what's going on. And, you know, I know you guys talk a lot of speculation. We're going to talk about that going forward, but uh, you know, you guys, that's one thing is that you've done a great job of, of showing how reading a book can play into the speculation and how that can work out. So 
I just think the addition of Manimal to what you guys are already doing over at Lords, it really rounds out your content so much. So, and to uh, be honest with you, I always felt we were missing because um, on the show we have tons of collecting experience, right? But not oh, yeah. a, a lot of them read every stuff every week. Mm. I try to reset man i would get so backed up but manimal is great because he can offer a uh, uh a perspective of a person who reads every books every wednesday right going yeah, to man. the shop every wednesday i used to do that but then i got you know work and everything and i couldn't make it to the shop and so now i read things two months after it came out so i can catch up where zach if we talk about something he can say oh yeah that's the character that's coming out here and there and he'll always say yeah that's in this book that book is whack don't read it. it's trash <laughs> you know it's, it's like that's the problem so, is I, I sometimes can give too honest of an opinion and and obviously you know i by no means is my opinion gospel of paul if you will it just you say what you think you know if i like right. something i don't like something a lot of people do a lot of people don't so but um covid is killing me man with all the uh no comics every week I, honestly i was ready to weather the storm and then they said no new comics and now this diamond stuff. Oh my God. It's got to stop, man. Yeah. Man. Well, actually it was a blessing to skies for me because I was literally five months backed up on my reading, bro. I got like almost totally caught up. And now <laughs> that the book's coming out again, I'm like, that was like a blessing in the skies. Yeah. I, I'm with, with you, Tim. I enjoyed getting caught up and even go back and read some old books and old on the buses and old trades. And it was funny because once the machine started moving again and we started creating the content that we had put on pause, it was weird because you'd see stuff and you'd like almost like I said when you would watch a show on Netflix, leave it and then come back and go, wait a minute, what episode am I on? What's mm -hmm. going on here? Right. You gotta reread it, right? Was, you're starting that machine back up and like, right. hey, I thought this was solicited before. And then even with the FOC stuff, that stuff would get messed up because it'd be solicited for FOC, then get moved. Or, hey, 92 hasn't even come out yet, but they're soliciting 94 for final order cutoff. What the heck? Yeah. Come on. It's like, Bro, that's a great example. On my Instagram, I just posted a day for Multiple Comic Monday. For those who don't know, it's a good hashtag for Mondays, right? You post multiples of a book. So mine was Batman 92, the art germ punchline variant, right? Because I think Manuel and I are both in the yeah. same boat. We pre-ordered this. Three months ago, when it was actually Batman 94 or 93. Yeah, back in April. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but then they changed it, and they said it's moving up. So I bought mine on eBay, right? I ordered it, and I said, hey. Well, he goes, well, yeah. But you know what? It's, it's going to move up, but we'll still, uh, we'll still honor the, the whatever you bought. I said, cool. And then the shutdown happened. So I just got them today, right? And then we're thinking, man, I could have got these at the store and saved, yep. my, you know, the price of shipping on it. But, you know, that's the thing about speculation or whatever you want to say you know it's all about timing it's not so much what it is or how accurate it is it's what the timing of you getting it or selling it or doing whatever you want with it because if you are going to play this game it's all about the timing and i know we got some topics but kind of while we're on that topic you know speaking about punchline i mean this is something i feel like this whole shutdown is really affecting the steam that was building up with that yes. character whether you agree with the steam behind punchline and whatnot whether you're a fan or not or you don't buy into the hype it was hot. There's no denying that. And honestly, I don't see people talking about this 92 the way it would have been talked about if nothing would have happened. Yeah, yeah but I, I agree, but it's very unique because the, the secondary market pricing of the first appearance has stayed steady. That's true. But I totally agree with what you're yeah. saying about the buzz going forward. The Hurt buzz, DC, man. The, the buzz seems to be um, just dwindling. Uh, it didn't seem like 92 had the heat we all expected. Right. Yeah. The, the the Joker 80th that everybody was waiting on that punchline origin, mm -hmm. that didn't really hit. Like, no, that was you know, like a, 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 lot of a dud, hit. man. Yeah. So well, I just, um I don't know. I, it's going to be interesting with this character going yeah. forward. Well, what's interesting is, so the shutdown happened and what I think it was twofold, right? So uh, Reader Buzz died mm -hmm. and it gave chance DC to really make these giant so, giant print runs on it yep. which we may not have seen if things were just going as they normally were right i mean now because if things would have gone how they normally were we would have seen multiple printings of batman 92 i don't think we're going to get multiple printings now because i think a lot of people are sitting on a bunch of stock right now of batman 92 if it would have just allowed to come out like it was on a you know monthly bi-weekly basis what have you i think you would have saw you know uh 92 uh second print third print variant fourth print variant like they normally do but now I, there's so much out there i don't think it's i mean but i think the batman book is gonna have some legs down the road because it has the origin of uh spoiler alexis 
<laughs> it seems like, I don't know. It just seems like, man, I built this up. And who, oh, it's Alexis. <laughs> and that art drum cover is just gorgeous. Yeah, it is I mean, good, man. It's a good cover. Yeah, yeah. but it, what's the purple one? That's the one that – is that – that's the, the variant that's one, one. The design one in 25. And that's yeah. another thing I find interesting um, is the announcement that the uh, Legion of Superhero series is now going to get the uh, one in 25 design variants so now is that a new policy dc is doing where they're bringing in these one in 25 incentives again is this because of the change in distribution is this a, a dcbs midtown call um where is that coming from that suddenly that we're going to start seeing uh, yeah because right. dc historically hasn't done large racial variants it's typically no, they, cover a cover b they don't do they many one in out against them. they yeah, spoken yeah. out against them that they didn't want retailers to feel obligated to try to earn these incentives yeah. so they were only using them on landmark issues maybe yeah, i mean cr like crossovers and uh and like a lot of mini series type stuff would have the the incentives that would be really it um but you know now we're starting to see it was one thing when it was like batman 92 okay i get it punchline is special um but then now we're doing 92 through like 100 and then right. and then now it's crossing over into legion of superheroes for gold lantern um and then it, it that works where i start to sit and go i wonder where the the, the stopping point is or if we're just going to consistently see i think they should do it i think it gives the dc fans and readers collectors uh, something else to get right now I, I don't think they would mind i mean I don't know. I know it's not a topic, and I think Manimal and I have talked about it privately, but on our show, we really didn't dive deep into uh, the whole DC distribution thing. And, you know, what? when I talk to people who own retail shops, they're skeptical of it. You know, regardless of you think Diamond does a good job or does a bad job, they've been doing the job for decades right. now. And comic dealers are, excuse me, let me rephrase that, LCS owners are creatures of habit more so than any other creature on the planet earth, man. They do not like change, right? Give them two different ordering systems. They're gonna, it's going to, they, you know, and the, if you watch the bleeding, read the bleeding cool article where they talked to some uh, comic shop owners, they were not happy with it. Yeah. And so if, you know, and I'm pretty sure you guys already talked about it on your show, but I want to read a text that I got from a friend of mine who owns a shop and, you know, and this is what majority of them think that people realize, Oh, it's just a different, uh, another distributor. Well, in some cases, these are distributors that their reselling competitor is ordering directly from them. And that's where a lot of them are kind of like, eh, I don't know, you know, because if, if you don't trust the system as it is already, you're definitely not going to trust it, that your competitor knows what you're ordering and the right. amounts that you are ordering. Yeah. So then they can either double your order or here, um, here's what it says. So I asked him, what do you guys, what do you think of this DC stuff? My concern is the ripple this may have with other companies such as Marvel. The two biggest concerns that our competitor, that, that are, or your competitors now have a clear understanding what the nation is ordering based on what they're ordering on. And they can use these other store accounts to reach qualifiers. So what that essentially is saying is, if Midtown is using their distribution and somebody's ordering a thousand, they say they may be saying, Oh yeah, put that as part of our order so we can get more incentive covers. So I mean, I'm not saying that's happening, but that's the perception of some comic shop owners thinking that, well, if Midtown's whatever distributor, what are they called? Lunar? Or is that Lunar and UCS? Yeah. Yeah. So they're thinking Lunar, let's say Marvel has a one in five hundred, right? So you have to order five hundred. What if two shops give them uh, uh, or each an order for 500 and then uh, and then die and then uh, uh, midtown says let me add that to mine so i can get three one in 500s and i only ordered 500 right you see that's what their fear is i'm not saying it's possible but you know anytime oh, you're it's giving gonna your, happen <laughs> to me that's so, gonna you know happen. you leave that open that's gonna happen yeah so what's gonna happen is uh, some comic shops are gonna ask diamond look you guys need to show us your books to make sure you guys are on the up and up right you know and timing is just timing is just not ideal either yeah. where it's it like a bad, in bad on dc's marketing side that down to now you know because what one of the shops told me like look we couldn't open our stores. Why are you guys sending us new books? And they weren't even good new books. They were like kitty books, coloring books, and some other stuff. Remember during the shutdown yeah. when they had this weird release schedule? And they were like, look, I can't open my store, yet my customers are calling me asking for these books that you sent. Because, you know, so I think that part, it was bad timing. So we'll see, man. I mean, I think after a while, people won't care. As long as you see the books, they don't care who it's coming from. But I has 
has Midtown or DCBS ever done this volume of ordering before? I mean, that's going to be interesting if they can handle, you know, all this from nationwide, you know, so we'll see. Well, and I think there's a lot of factors too um, that a lot of people don't see that's just business factors. So, um, you know, like I know Chuck from Mile High talked about the fact that, you know, Diamond has extended him credit during lean parts in his business that has allowed him to continue his business. Mm -hmm. Now by taking 50% of the books that he orders away from Diamond, that hurts his ability to receive that credit. That also hurts his ability to put in the size orders he does, which then allows him the, the, the sort of financial flexibility. We talked to a retailer today who was receiving 53% discount through Diamond, who then when they went to, I think it was UCS, got quoted that the highest they could get was 35. Wow. So you start looking at that. I mean, you're talking about an 18% increase um, in cost across the board for DC. So is, at, is that why Midtown had a 50% off sale? <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> Bro, yeah. that was an epic, epic troll, man. I can, oh my God, that was hilarious. I also wanted to go back a second when you're talking about the DC incentives recently and how pe some people are happy about it. It's funny because we often talk about the collection, how it's cyclical, how collectors and speculation. New 52 DC comics had those incentives. You had what, up to one in 200s. And yeah. then right when Rebirth happened, a lot of the collectors were so excited that DC was just going with cover A, cover B. They weren't going to do incentives. And then within those past couple of years, now people want those incentives again. And now you're seeing it with those one in 25s, for, especially for the Batman title. So it's just crazy. We often talk about how that cycle goes around. And there's just more point to it right there with the the DC grass incentives. is always greener until you get to the other side. Because I, I think on the Marvel side, they, they almost, the antithesis where they overdo it with variants and make you order, you know, how these crazy ordering obstacles, but it gives people something to go hunt on Wednesday, right? Hey, can I get that one in 25, yeah. that one in 50, that elusive ever one in store variant, right? Or I mean, even for Marvel, side. like you were saying not too long ago, it wouldn't be an incentive, but you had to order so many other of the previous issue, right? You'd have to order yeah. you, I mean, I or not even, issue, it's right. not even that issue. It could be a totally unrelated right. title, yeah, right? 40 yeah. issues of Guardians of the Galaxy 6. <laughs> yeah. To get, yeah, yeah. to get uh, like, you know, to get a totally different like Punisher book, you know, it's right. kind of weird, but they they scaled that back some, but it's, if you ever really want to know, just go in there and talk to your LCS owner about it. I mean, there's some shops, you know, when I talk to some people across the country, their shops don't even deal with it at all. They hate variants, you know, and they don't get that. And I feel bad for them because then they have to go on the aftermarket. And by that time, the aftermarket is going to, you know, you know, what we could sell, call the aftermarket, we call it eBay. You're going to be paying top dollar for, you know, what you could have got at the store. My LCS is pretty fair. You know, he doesn't look on eBay. He'll just make a guess. You know, I get a one in 50 variant for like 20 bucks typically. My, uh, my LCS, you know, but sometimes people will look and I think I, I'm at a benefit. I always talk about the West Coast has a benefit on New Comic Book Day when it comes on because by time we wake up on the East Coast, we already know what's hot, right? People will, and on social media is perfect because they're like, damn it, this sold out. I'm like, really? Let me go to my shop and see what's there. That's true. That's true. That's, that's extremely smart. Unless you're hunting on eBay because then the East Coast people have already bought sure. up the cheap copy. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, now you guys talked a little bit about kind of collaboration and coming together. Um, and I think that almost as much as the type of content, the meshing of personalities when you work together um, on YouTube is, is so important. And we've seen both the good and the bad sides of that, I think, in all of our experiences um, in the last several years in YouTube, but you guys recently have linked up with another rising star in the comics community. And of course, I'm talking about the scoop prognosticator himself, Mr. <laughs> Mikey Sutton. I like um, that. So, you know, he has, he has really taken the, the world by storm. When we first heard his name, it was kind of like, who is this guy? Um, and now you really cannot deny uh, his importance, especially within social media. Um, how did you guys get together with Mikey? Uh, and I would love to know, like, what would you respond to the critics who have criticized these scoops and, and kind of kind of been like, who is Mikey Sutton? Well, well, this is how really it started. So um, last year, I think right on April or so, um, 
I got a message sent to me by somebody who said, hey, man, uh, I've actually, I saw your name dropped on another channel. Um, I like what you do. And I, I have some, some information. I didn't really believe him, right? So I was like, well, let me show me some screenshots of what you have. And there's this, that, and the other. And he goes, you know, I work uh, within, around studios. I know a lot of people in the industry. And, you know, we have a, kind of this private group that we talk about spec books, but we don't make it public. I was like, that's interesting. So I dubbed him the Black Knight. He's remained anonymous to this day. I haven't really, he's been, um, Mikey doesn't work with the studios. My source is a lot closer. I can't really get that. And that's why you haven't seen anything from the Black Knight in a while because of the shutdown. But we got something coming from the Black Knight uh, next week, actually. But anyway, um, so we started doing these Black Knight reports where I was getting an anonymous source and we just kind of started with it and some of them hit. And so we started picking up traction. And you know, that's right when the channel got deleted uh, the first time. <laughs> I was closing 5,000 subs and I posted, a, I think it was a Stan Lee video that I shot from within a movie theater. And I got, my channel got taken down. Not a strike, not anything. It just got wow. taken down and I couldn't get it back. So then I, I had to bring the channel back. And then Mikey reached out to me and sent me a private message. Uh, and because on one of my videos um, prior to getting scoops and everything, I had said, we looked at some prices of books and we go, why are these books jumping? I said, look, there's a secret cabal of collectors that don't like the media, social media groupings. They discuss amongst themselves and they go out and buy the books. And that's why you're seeing these price jumps. They don't announce it. They don't post it on Instagram. These are private collectors who are privy to information and they go out and buy all the books for the news drops like way in advance, right? And I said, there's a secret cabal of collectors. Mikey reached out to me and he said, you're right. I'm part of that group. The Black Knight is part of that group. So Mikey found out through uh, the Black Knight and him, had, he and him had talked because they kind of belong to the same group. There's, put it this way, there's, there's private groups on Facebook that do this that you don't know about. And we're talking about small groups numbered like 270 members only, right? And they go out, a couple of guys work at studios. They'll tell each other the information. I'm pretty sure you guys have had this conversation in years past with a certain somebody who works somewhere in Culver City or somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> but so Mikey said, hey, I got some information. And I didn't know who he was, right? So I was like, can you show me some receipts? I said, I don't want to sound like a dick, but can you show me? And so he shows me his private Facebook group. And, and he shows me, he dropped the Fox Marvel news back in 2015 before anybody else did. And then he started giving me his history. And I said, really? He was a writer for Amazing Heroes. You remember the, the fan mag, right? Back in the 80s and 90s, Amazing Heroes. It was a comic book-based magazine. They'd talk about articles, everything comic books. Basically, when, when the 90s had tons of periodical, Wizard, Amazing Heroes, and all these good stuff. So I was like, all right, well, we'll see. So he gave me a few scoops. And they started popping, and things started working. And the biggest one was um, when Spider-Man and Sony were going to divorce Marvel right prior to, I think it was D23, right? It was in between, I, I remember it was in between San Diego Comic-Con and D23. And Mikey has said, look, I know people from within Sony. This isn't a, this is only a temporary thing. Matter of fact, they're still in discussions now. And we were getting panned for this information that we were doing. But Mikey said, stick with it. So I was doing videos like two times a week. Nope, Sony's not going anywhere. They're still talking. They're going to strike a new deal. Sure enough, boom, we got a new deal with Spider-Man and Sony and Disney. And then that's when my channel got elevated to a weird spot, which I wasn't comfortable with, is uh, movie scoopers started attacking myself and Mikey Sutton. So the Charles Murphy of the world, the Daniel RPKs of the world, the hashtag shows of the world, Geeks Worldwide, Skyler Show, all these douchebags, kind of, kind of on left field. <laughs> and I'm like, who the fuck are these guys? And they're attacking me. There's a Mikey Sutton subreddit that there's a Lord section on. I was like, this is getting way too weird, bro. You know, I was doing this thing for YouTube and, you know, friends and, you know, fans who follow and they, hey, this is a book you guys might want to get. Get it before the news pops because then it's going to be expensive, you know. And what I tell people long-term spec, it just makes fun digging in long boxes. You know what I mean? So when you get a book for five bucks, if it pops, it pops. If it doesn't, it was only five bucks and you had fun as part of the chase, right? The digging in the long boxes. So I got into this weird space where I was Twitter guys were attacking me and I was like, you know, and I'm, you know, me and man were like, you know what, let's find these guys and beat them up. That's our first instinct, right? Because I'm not used to this whole, what the fuck is a Twitter beef? I was, that's what I was asking. What is a Twitter beef? Why am I in this? So 
the block button is amazing function. I don't have to deal with them anymore. And here's the thing. Charles Murphy is a big movie scooper now. And Daniel RPK both have combined like two, 300,000 Twitter followers. Both of them reached out and sent me DMs on Twitter to ask me about stuff. And that's when I knew, I was like, this is getting weird. Why are they asking me something? Then they turned around and used it against me and attacked me to the point Charles Murphy, uh, actually, he sent me a DM and was like buddying up to me. I was like, oh, yeah, cool. All right. And I was like, are you still? He goes, oh, no, I don't write articles for that hashtag show anymore. I said, okay. And I said, this is what I heard. And I'm telling him. I heard that um, Donnie Yen was in talks to be in Shang-Chi. Not as Shang-Chi, but as a possible thing. He goes, oh, really? I said, oh, yeah, that's cool. He goes, oh, yeah, I don't really write anymore. Two days later, he posted on that hashtag show on the website. And I was like, I saw it on Twitter. And I was like, wait a second. This is my scoop. And I had the screenshots. And then he blocked me on Twitter. And ever since then, it's like, he got, they got all their buddies to team up and da, 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 and, you know, staying on Twitter and all this. And I was like, yeah, whatever, guys, I'm going to do my thing. And one time I did take the argument to Instagram where I have, we have, you know, you got, I know you guys, you guys know me. We have tons, thousands of great, cool guys. Man, my friends went off on them. I think my friend Swolverine uh, threatened to go to their office and fight all 40 of them. So <laughs> it, it was just, it just, the world of Twitter is so toxic. You know what I mean? Like YouTube, you can, you can make videos and typically it's us and our friends and we're in the live chat. We're talking, talking comics, having a good time. These movie scoopers though, they they take this, it's to them. It's all about, you know, productions and this is first and this is first where, and I've always said this on every show I've been on or even on our show. I'm not so concerned about when something is starting, who's going to be in it, who's directing, who the production company is. I care that the character has been talked about. That means we as collectors, we need to go out and get that character's appearances. You know, and I think what, in, in terms of, and sorry, Tim, so I, th I think like in terms of critics, you know, you mentioned, what do you think about what critics say? And like, you know, whether you get, I think the whole world word speculation implies that you don't really know. And I think some of these people take it as too much as gospel. Like you say, for example, Donnie Yen's going to be in uh, Mandarin. So, oh, well, you got it wrong. And then they try to get you on it. You know what I mean? And it's not, look, you're all adults. Buy what books you think. If you don't believe it, don't believe it. And if you miss out, yo, that's what happens. Sometimes you're going to miss out. Sometimes you're going to win big. It's speculation for a reason. So when people get really butthurt and, and upset about this stuff you know it's ridiculous like yo you're playing the game do you go to vegas and gamble it's the same stuff like it's a chance man and like tim said it's it's great for the hobby in a way because for multiple reasons one you hear about new characters you get these little characters that you don't even think about like stained glass scarlet in moon knight that's talked about a lot you know and now all of a sudden people are like who's that i'd like to read those stories let me dig in the long box and whether it hits big or not, you have fun with it, man. You reinvigorate the hobby. You're reading stories you didn't read before, possibly. You're picking up books you didn't. You're also helping out LCSs that are selling, you know, tons of backlog of issues that they just want out of their dang shop, you know. So, I mean, I don't know why anyone gets upset. Look, it got you to the store. It hyped you up. Have fun with it. That's all it is. It's plus, it's, it's fun to pull the thread on some of that stuff, and you start doing your own Columbo type right, stuff man. where you're doing your own speculation, and you that's what makes it kind of fun. And, and yeah, it you makes going to a yeah. you see a character, and you're like, oh, this character. Here's another big character that's in their arc. I wonder if that person will show up. And it's fun, man. And you're, you're like producing your own movie in your mind. At that point, you're like, and then it'd be cool if they go over right. here. And this. So I'm gonna go <laughs> it's going to be ultimatum. Not, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it, it made like, I went to Bakersfield Comic Con with my buddy and I was like, man, this is a garbage ass show, man. But you know what? I was able to get some like really like small spec books, you know, that I was like, you know, what? I can get this for five bucks, five bucks, five bucks, boom, 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 boom. And if it happens, it happens. But if not, then, you know, I can sell it for whatever. It just makes, it, if you didn't have these things to speculate on, it just would make collecting boring. Cause you'd be getting, yeah, what are we going to do? I'll go after 181, Hulk 181. Yeah, I mean, no, and you know, 180 here. 180. <laughs> we're, we're 180 on this side. Two first. But like I always said, man, it's like, the days of the knowledgeable collector or whatever that, that, mont, that, that code you wanted to give somebody, it doesn't exist anymore because the advent of the internet. Basically, you go into any comic shop or a show with your phone and have an encyclopedia of knowledge there. You know what I mean? So you can look up whatever you want. So there's apps, there's websites, there's like at least 
two dozen this year that wasn't there five years ago right. that give that give you the the sold out you know edge on collecting, but you still need to know. You still need to know what a cover looks like. And I think muscle memory is probably more important than anything in the world because the more you're on social media, the more you follow the right people on Instagram and somebody posts a book and say, hey, man, that's a dope cover. I, you know what? I just saw that. I just grabbed it. You know, I got it for a killer price. For, so, or actually, because YouTube was like, back in 2015 when I started, I started on Instagram 2012 showing comics. And then 2015, I started doing like haul videos. I was like, well, this is kind of cool, man. I can... I can actually sit there, show a book and talk about it and, you know, what it is, the first appearance or, you know, first cover of so-and-so, first meeting, blah, blah, blah. And then that's when YouTube was kind of, I, was, I always say like I'm a second generation YouTuber because the first generation is like from 2010 Six, and it was yeah. really small. Yeah. Now it's like, it's huge, right? Any given day, there's like five live shows all at the same time. You know, we're like cannibalizing our own community because there's not enough of us to go around as it is, right? But that's how much it's grown ever since. Like, you know, I always tell people it's chic to be geek now. Wasn't it wasn't so when I was a kid where you know I want if I was with the cool kids I'd be like hey let me hide this comic before anybody sees right. this. You know I what I mean? Sports. I didn't collect comics. Exactly. I didn't yeah. About that. Right. I, I think getting, that's something I think that's something we all have in common, right? I think that's why we we kind of blend well together is that we're all yeah. that type that type of guy. And then we've gotten back into this as adults. There's two things that you mentioned that I, I want to comment on. First, on the Mikey Sutton thing. I think what's tough about what Mikey Sutton does and why maybe it's tough for outsiders to understand that content that you guys produce, um, is it's it's all prognostication. Now, there's certainly whatever information he gets that leads to these scoops. That's not prognostication, right? That's based in some sense of reality. But we're talking about things we can't prove. So anytime you're talking about something you can't prove, you're always going to open yourself up. So I give you guys a lot of credit. We just did uh, – we took part in Mikey's birthday scoop jam. Yeah. And that, that was almost – it was exciting but a little nerve-wracking because I was expecting a little bit of backlash, uh, a little bit of people saying – you know, well, how do you know this and how can you prove this? And certainly we can't do any of that. Um, but at the same point, you know, all we can do is kind of stand by the track record that Mikey has has proven and that you guys have helped to really cement. Um, and that was something we were happy to, to, to take part in. But I think that that's just what it, Mikey's game is. It, it's a brave game because you got to kind of put yourself out on that limb. Um, and sit there for a while. And then that kind of plays into what Banimal was talking about, about speculation. Um, we stopped using that word. It's not that we don't speculate. It's just that that word carries a connotation that makes people feel a certain way. Um, and the reality is we consider ourselves like sports talk radio for comics. We give our opinions. So you can call it a speculation, but I have certain opinions and I definitely have commenters who will disagree, but my opinions that like eighties and nineties cartoon and toy nostalgia is going to rule the next decade as far as movies and, 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 and the next wave of, of IP that's getting picked up. Um, we believe in classic stories that are getting overlooked that are like blue chip investments that will never play into movies, but are, are just getting, you know, classic stories, classic covers that are just getting overlooked. Um, you know, we, we believe in cameo appearances uh, are massively undervalued as the next generation will ultimately get to make a decision what they believe a first appearance is. Um, and then these second wave of characters like Miles Morales and Spider-Gwen, we've been championing like their late prints and their number one issues long before that became a kind of cool thing. But in order to do any of this, right, you have to step out on a limb. You have to be willing to take the heat. And if you don't deliver somebody returns, they're going to complain to you. But that's what we always say. Like, I'm not your comic stockbroker. Um, you know, I'd be taking fees from you if that <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, yeah. If just book pops, give me 50% of it. Right. I, there you go. Yeah. Right, right. It's and also I, something that doesn't happen for a while, too. So you talk yeah. Shang-Chi and you don't see a movie, even without COVID, for three years, people forget it and are on to the next thing. The news cycle will kill what you forgot and what you, you remember. And so no one ever goes back and remembers, man. That's why these uh, the movie scooper guys that the aforementioned movie scooper guys on Twitter they always love to retweet how they were first to announce like you know and I'm gonna tell you the deep dark the little secret that they that that they use so basically they all belong to productionweekly.com you too can be a movie scooper if you go to productionweekly.com and you pay your monthly fees and you get they they call them casting grids 
right? And they're cons- and some of them are better than others because basically what they're doing is they're playing a game of tic-tac-toe. They see a casting call and they say, uh, male in his 30s is uh, Asian, looks that it Oh, that's the man. You know what I mean? They, mm-hmm. So they have to have some comic book knowledge and they kind of put two and two together and they go they, and, and I don't use or Mikey doesn't use production notes. He has people that gives him lists and then it's up to me and the guys to go through this list and I, you know, ask my animal. Sometimes I'll give him a list. He goes, bro, really? I say, hey man, <laughs> these lists, there's no context with it. It's just a name, right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, so, I'll have like Amadeus Cho. <laughs> exactly. I was given Amadeus Cho. Now immediately people will be like saying, well, oh, it's going to be the Hulk. I was like, no, no, no. I was specifically given the name Amadeus Cho. I wasn't given the name the Hulk. My guess is you're not going to see a hulked out version of Amadeus Cho for a while because they want to keep it as Amadeus Cho, right? You know, because he has a history of being a psychic, seventh smartest guy in the you world. Gotta, you got to tell the scientist story right. before. Exactly, you know. exactly. So a lot of times. It totally awesome. Yeah. yeah, so we do a lot of research when we get these lists to kind of parse out what exactly they are talking about. And sometimes it's two characters and I'm thinking, what is, okay, well, oh yeah, Disney Plus is working on this show. So that's why this character is probably tied into it. And this character, ah, I see. Like one time we had the name Nova, right? But it was for a Fantastic Four list, right? So I'm like, oh, they're talking about Frankie Ray. They're not talking about Richard Ryder, right? I mean, you know, so we had to parse it. Because a lot of times he gets this information from people. They just have a list. They say, hey, we got this list of characters that are going to be are being reserved for the MCU for this project or that project. That's all I have is a list. So then we have to kind of go through there and say, ah, okay, so this, 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 and that. And then we look up what the first appearances are. And then we like, you know, and then a lot of times it's like these characters are already established. And so we can't say, go out and look for this FF48. It may pop. No. <laughs> so then we have to look for, you know what? These books are far, far too expensive. But, you know, here's an alternative, man. Get this one. It's the first appearance, the first meeting of, or something along those lines. There's tons of different branches on the collecting tree that you can get. It's not always first appearance, first issue, right? There's tons of other things that you can yep. get off of that tree. And we try to sprinkle that in with the stuff that we talk about. So. You're sitting there talking about the Mikey Sutton, and you guys have been doing this for quite a while now. Given all the material that you covered, given all the movie news and ru- we say rumors, with the content that you guys have covered so far, is there a certain piece or which one are you guys most excited to see to play out? Whether it's MCU, X Men, Disney Plus, DC, HBO Max, is there anyone that you guys are like really excited to see come to fruition? Go ahead, Zach. I'll let you. Yeah, I think for me, obviously, I'm an X-Men guy, so I want to see X-Men, but I'm very hesitant and scared about it. So I I don't want to say that's my thing. I'm going to be honest with you. I love the idea of the Disney Plus stuff. When they started announcing all the different shows, I was on board. You know, you're talking Moon Knight, you're talking WandaVision, Loki, all that stuff. Loved it. Now, I was still a little skeptical, but then Mandalorian hit, and Mandalorian was dope. And I was like, okay, this is good content. They're actually doing something. Don't get me wrong. You won't hear me hate on Netflix, but it has its, it had its weaknesses with the MCU. Limitations, yeah. They're getting getting movie budgets. I mean, they're getting actual real budgets to use. Yeah, and you know, smaller episode sizes, I think were the big difference in my opinion. So I I really like it. So I think if I were to answer the question, it's the Disney Plus stuff, whether it's, you know, Marvel, whether it's Star Wars. I mean, I'm really on the Star Wars train right now. All the, the rumors and hype. We haven't been getting a lot of Marvel stuff lately. We're getting great Star Wars stuff. And all of it is just awesome with Filoni and uh, Favreau. I mean, what's not to look forward to? Mm. Bro, I like how it's I, making I, a bunch of uh, Star Wars Clone, Clone Wars, the animated series, and it's making a bunch of new fans from all the Mandalorian stuff that's been going on. Oh, yeah, man, for sure. Yeah, I'm with uh, Manimal and uh, and the Disney Plus stuff, uh, but for a different reason, because I, for the longest time, I was thinking to my, all right, Disney is going to be doing a streaming service with Marvel content. This is really going to test what we consider, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, speculation, right? In the past, it's always been the big two. Whatever DC and Marvel says, those books pop, right? Independence, meh. Uh, Hollywood options, there's a hundred of them in Hollywood right now. You know, if you don't get them, you know, for a dollar, why bother? They may never even get made. Uh, God country, I'm looking at you. But anyway, um, so there's tons of that. But I always said, look, the stuff on ABC TV or Netflix, it it popped a little bit, but not a ton, right? But they I said when, toes in the water. 
exactly. But when I said when Kevin Foggy touches something, that makes it pop. And that yeah. coming on to Disney Plus, all these Marvel properties, and you, you've seen it. When they announced Moon Knight, She-Hulk, uh, all these different things, they just blew up to the point where, you know, it's like, be careful what you wish for. You know, now they're hot, and now those books are, are somewhat unattainable for a lot of folks. But I think it's been interesting to see how a proper streaming done with the budget that they're doing. We're talking like Game of Thrones budgets, right, for these Disney Plus Marvel shows and how the, the market reacts to it. And I say the market, I mean comic book uh, collectors buying back issues. Um, and I think this is the first time we've seen that. Netflix moved the needle a little bit, right? I mean, if you look at uh, Umbrella Academy, that book moved a little, but it not really crazy. CW, remember when Flash had all those, the rogues villains that were coming in, those books popped a little bit, but for the most part, nobody specs CW, nobody specs on ABC TV, nobody really specs on the runaways. But now, Kevin Feige has it and his big budgets. I'm thinking this is really interesting how this is going to work out and how these books are going to jump when a character, because now the MCU is literally, they can go between Disney plus and, uh, and the movies and it's, it's a one stop shop. Yeah. But what, to answer your question, what I'm most excited about is right over my shoulder right there. That's yeah. the cloak of levitation, my friend. And I am so stoked for Dr. Strange into the multiverse of madness. I think, People have cannot fathom how large this movie is going to be. This is going to be talking about Thanos. <laughs> no. Is he back there? No, no, no. That's my cocoa he wants it back really bad. When it's winter, I wear that. It's way too hot right now in Cali to be wearing that. Um, but I think the more and more I find out this movie, it's going to be huge. It's going to introduce basically the ability to introduce the Fox characters, the mutants, whatever you know, Sony. I mean, it, it just bridges so many different things. And then lately we've been talking about, like we were talking about, what were those things, Manimal, that we had on our last show? Uh, they ghost were going to be used. The ghost, ghost boxes. boxes, right? Ghost boxes that we heard have been are, are going to be used in upcoming MCU properties, which means they have the ability to, to teleport between different multiverses or realities. And I think Doctor Strange, you got Scarlet Witch. I mean, that's basically the House of Se House of N, uh, Avengers disassembled and everything rolled into one, right? She's going to open up the doorways to allow all these different properties to come through and happen. And I just happen to be a huge Doctor Strange fan. So that, and obviously Shang-Chi, because I want to see where they go with, uh, I want to see how Marvel does a gritty hand-to-hand -hand based combat martial arts film because we man, we kind of seen that you know captain america iron fist was awful his unfighting ass um but i want to see a big budget martial arts action film from marvel i want to see how it's done and uh, hopefully because there's a whole bunch of characters they can introduce into the mcu that are martial arts based or street level based because kind of the MCU kind of has gone away from that, right? If you really think about it, Netflix had the Defenders and half of it was good and the other half was, meh, you know, I'll watch it if there's nothing else on and it's 4 a.m. on a Saturday. <laughs> but outside of that, I mean, that's it. I'm really curious to see how Disney Plus plays out and how that affects the back issue markets. When Imagine just like episodic episode and then one episode and you're like, holy shit, is that MODOK? Did he just pop up on screen? You know, and how that'll push a book, right? If you see like... Colleen Wing just pop up in some series all of a sudden. You're like, wow, hey, she just popped up out of nowhere, you know? So that and in the MCU, that I, man, that Doctor Strange film. I just, I'm glad Hollywood is finally opening back up now. So they're finally being able to uh, start filming again. So we can kind of get this ball moving. And not to just like, uh, you know, stick to the Marvel. I know everyone kind of always just talks about Marvel because let's be honest, MCU was the hot product. And I think everyone is a little, I, I know we both, Tim and I both love DC. I'm assuming you guys do as well. Yeah. But DC has very much burned a lot of us yeah. over and over again, you know? And sometimes it's sad to say that the best representation of the, the DC universe was the CW, which wasn't horrible, but it wasn't great. You know, and then we had the DC universe. Um, Titans was fabulous, loved Titans. But then we had all the Swamp Thing drama and the... Uh, Swamp uh, Thing was good until it ended. You could tell they needed two more episodes yeah. to finish it. It was just very much, I feel like everyone is hesitant to jump back on the DC bandwagon because you've been burned, you know? So that's why I'm trying to get in now early. That's my whole thing is you got to skate where the puck isn't. So like I'm the two MCU properties I'm very excited about is I actually completely agree with you guys. Um, X-Men is my shit, but yeah. I think that everybody is going to focus X-Men. Oh, for sure. Every five dollar first appearance is going to become twenty to forty dollars. Yeah, and, and Mystic, gonna, mystical and, and space, I think, is they're going to spike. Yeah, cosmic, cosmic and the yeah, supernatural. Cosmic yeah. And mystical, yeah, they're they're going to spike short term, um, and then you're not going to get that long term. 
I think Doctor Strange will be able to add elements of horror into the MCU, which is a genre they, they haven't hit yet. And then Sam Shang- Raimi, baby, Sam Raimi. Right. And then Shang-Chi bringing in the like street level and martial arts, which is a Kung whole Christian, genre yeah. of itself that is so beloved that has yet to play out. And that's what I like about the MCU is the MCU is so universal that, you know, your girlfriend, your wife, uh, your, your buddy who made fun of you in high school because you liked comics, all can find a movie within the MCU that fits their style. So I'm right. glad we're going into those. Plus, I think the thing I'm excited about Shang-Chi is I think that there's going to be more uh, opportunity for positive investment because those characters are so unknown to the general public. Um, if if that area, because uh, we've talked about it on the channel from Agents of Atlas to stuff with Amadeus Chow to so many different places they can go with that area of the the MCU, it, I think that's going to be ripe for the picking. But the DC universe, I'm still very bullish on because I love what I'm seeing with The Rock. I love that The Rock refuses to let this extended universe die, that he is like a one-man uh, uh wrecking crew trying to be the feige of dc um and and i give him credit for that that the, the, all the reports that he's gotten cavill back involved and um you know i'm excited for the whole i thought shazam was a fun movie oh, I, yeah. yeah you know i think super shazam, surprised by that right so i think shazam black adam superman that whole dynamic uh could make superman more entertaining than he's been over the last few years um and then and then furthermore I'm excited about HBO Max because I like Green Lantern is one of my favorite characters. I think there's so many different stories you can tell with Green Lantern that I think will be very universal. That'll give a a Star Wars feel almost. Um, And then I think that Justice League Dark, again, horror, to be able to bring in a horror mystical element uh, with some characters people are familiar with, like Swamp Thing and Constantine, and then a whole bunch of characters that the mass public hasn't even gotten a chance to see so many dead man's i want to see be such a hit with the awesome public i want to see full-on like dr fate specter just give me the whole like supernatural cosmic stuff because exactly here's uh, to bet to dc's detriment and to their i guess you saw it a pro and a con is they have batman and the problem is they have batman they're so bat centric with their comics it's like and I, I feel pummeled with so much dark shit sometimes. It's like, all right, you got dark nights, you got dark metal, you got, you know, it's like, okay, we get it. You want to be dark, right? But, you know, that's why Shazam was such a nice surprise because yep. it was like, you know what? This is big. This is like 80s Amblin stuff, right? This is what, it's, it should be fun too. It shouldn't be all dark and dreary. Give me a fucking color palette to work with. You know what I mean? And, you know, Marvel for the most part is light, but then you had Avengers Endgame, you had Civil War, you had Winter Soldier. Those are pretty serious in tone, even though it has humor elements, not a funny movie. But to this very day, I will pop an Ant-Man just so I can have a fucking good time, right? Because I, I absolutely love Ant-Man. I just think it's hilarious with Louise and telling Civil a story. War, that, that airport fight scene at Civil War, I could watch that. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean... Yeah, I mean, you know, like it has great. I mean, Black Widow, I wasn't even sold on until I saw the last trailer. I was like, okay, now I'm down. And now I'm down. But like we always say on our channel, I'm, like everybody says ad, naz- ad-, ad nauseum is Warner Brothers and specifically DC and Warner Brothers need a Kevin Feige, somebody who is invested in the comic books, who knows how to produce films. Because people like Jeff Johnson, no, Jeff Johnson's not that guy. He's a writer. He doesn't know how to do that. And keep need the be, exec's hands out of the pot. Exactly. You need uh-huh. you need somebody to listen to and somebody who has can command presence in a room. And Feige is that guy, right? I mean, I don't know who on the DC, I don't know if that's J.J. Abrams or not, to be honest with what I heard. J.J. kind of wants to do his own projects with right. top uh, robot, what's it? Bad robot. Bad robot. Well, I was thinking Topless Robot. It's that website from a long time ago. But, you know, they need somebody like that who is, you know, and Jeff Johns, you know, he's a good writer. Can he produce? Can he get people to work together, stay within budgets, build a cohesive universe? I don't know. I mean, Christopher Nolan could have been that guy, but he doesn't want to live in that sandbox all his life. I mean, the thing I would say is promote your other characters. We don't, the Holy Trilogy, everybody knows who Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman is. Well, how about the Holy somebody else for a change? You know, let's get some new characters, some new blood in there. I know they're steeped in history since the 30s and 40s and Fawcett and everything else, but get some new characters in and see how it goes. You know, I mean, it's I like... Think Jack's, I think you're, you're totally right, Jack, with, with Green Lantern. I mean, you're talking, you, like Tim just said, the Holy Trinity, but Green Lantern's up there also, and we really haven't dived into that. 
And let's not forget the surprise hit of Guardians of the Galaxy. And what was the original cosmic comic book of all time was Green Lantern. You got the color spectrum. You could eventually do the zombie Blackest Night stuff. And there's so many possibilities in there. And Legion they're just not superheroes touching. Superheroes are make great. I think that's why I like. Great. That's why I like uh, Green Lantern Corps 201. That first. Right. Uh, that first. Yeah, Green first Lantern yeah. Corps where you got all the all the like animalistic characters first appearing. I mm-hmm. think they can definitely take the Kilowogs and the little right. squirrel and turn those into Rocket Raccoon and Groot for for HBO Max. The other reason I'm bullish about HBO Max is you got to be honest. Like, how many of us expected Watchmen to be as good as it was? I think oh, most great. of us went into Watchmen and were like skeptical at how this was going to get pulled off. And then Watchmen was like, just, it blew everybody away, the quality of it. So I'm like, if you can do that, if you can be that true to the source material while creating new stories, and you can just duplicate that with the Green Lantern that we all know and love. Um, and then I love the fact that another thing I love about Green Lantern is there's not one Green Lantern. You, oh yeah, there's exactly. so many. Oh yeah, right. Hal Jordan's not the same from Jessica Cruz. Who's not the same from Simon Bass. Who's not the same from John Stewart. Who's not the same from Guy Gardner or Kyle Rayner or Alan Scott. And all of these guys have and girls have different upbringings, personalities, different reasons that motivate different them. Stories, yeah, it's right, great. right. Yeah, it's, it's almost so better that it is an episodic show as opposed to movies where you can't really get the character developed within two yes. to two and a half hours. Whereas a weekly show, and the next thing you know, you could have a spinoff show. And more importantly, is they're going to give it the proper budgets on HBO Max, which the CW could never ever do. I mean, it's it's oh, sometimes it's kind of brutal some of the budgets on there, but right. I think that's the main important part is they'll allow them to spend the money and this way also you as a, s- a subscriber, you have a somewhat of a return on your investment per se, right? If you're paying X amount of dollars a month, give me some quality, you know. I don't want to see your library of 500 movies that are static without anything new added to it. So, it, you know, it'd be nice too is um I know people love DC's animation, but I think they've been stuck in time for a while now. Their animation style hasn't changed. From what I've saw, the new, uh, what is that, Superman one? What is it called? The Realm of, the, the new apocalypse Superman. Or the Justice League? No, no. After, after the Apocalypse film, they're rebooting the DC animated universe uh-huh. with a Superman film. And it's a new animation style because I... Right. I understood their homage to like their beginnings of like, you know, the, the stuff Bruce that Tim, was, Paul D yeah. and all but, that. I mean, yeah. come on guys. It's like 2020. I mean, we're looking at these old kind of animated styles no, that they're using. I agree. I think the internet spider verse changed the game for DC. Oh God. Because, it's so good. Because yes. we sat and watched at DC animated films are amazing films as far as like story and content. But as much as a head start as they've had on the animated film game, they haven't had a feature length feature in theaters like that, that captivated a worldwide audience the way okay. Spider-Verse did. Part of that is exactly right. The animation style that kids were familiar with, very similar to what they see with Pixar and Disney um, versus even a current DC animated film looks like it came from our childhood. Um, and exactly. Then, yeah. And then the distribution, the straight to DVD style or video on demand style, um, it almost makes it seem like a secondary product versus I think that they could go longer. These movies are so good that if people saw them, I think that they would feel differently. That like that Suicide Squad animated film is better than the Suicide Squad movie. <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah, a exactly. so, yeah. you know. Yeah. But you know, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. They don't invest the the money. And then I don't know if you've been read lately that uh, Warner Brothers just sold their game division. So mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, and you gotta think, okay. If I have a game division and I have, uh, I want to make animated movies, why don't I put these two guys together? What's our, what are video games? It's a series of cutscenes that would look great as a fucking movie. I swear to God it would. All you have to do is get them together. But from what I'm seeing on the new Superman, it looks actually fantastic. There were some screenshots that grab and the animation style is totally different. It doesn't look like the square, really like overly square jaw, mm-hmm. kind of Johnny Bravo shaped Superman, right? Kind of really, you know, V-shaped figures. So, I mean, Apocalypse War, or was it called Apocalypse? That was fantastic. I mean, it was yeah. really good. Um, it, was, it could have been a little bit longer, I think, to flesh out the story, what the original comics was, but I thought it was great. And then I read, oh my God, this is a reboot of the DCEU. Uh, or East, the DC animated universe, whatever the hell that's called. Um, and so the Superman one is kind of going to start it over and everything. And so it's like, I see how they're doing the, the, the animated stuff, but then you had weird stuff like, 
the killing joke, which is awful. It was just the animation was just yeah. if if I watch an animated film, you if you don't catch me with the animation re- immediately, then I'm gonna be like, man. And that's better... one they did try to do in the theater through Fathom Events. Oh, it was awful, and it didn't do well at all. Oh, um, then they changed the story with like the addition of the Batgirl roof scene, which then. Right. starts opening up so many other questions <laughs> about <laughs> his relationship with Jim Gordon and like I just that was ill conceived. Yeah. yeah, if you think about DC anime or Warner Brothers animation, very very rich history going all the way back, right? But then you think like our my childhood, I grew up on uh the Super Friends. You know, giant bowl of cereal in 1977 sitting in my pajamas waking up at like 7 in the morning to watch cartoons, you know, and and that was where I kind of got my first introduction to DC uh, superheroes. And then it was when they expanded the rosters. And you had like the crazy Japanese samurai tornado guy, which only appeared in the in the cartoon, I believe. He never, I don't think he ever showed up in the comics, to be honest with you. You're talking about Red Tornado? No, there was an Asian dude. There was a samurai guy, and he had this kind of tornado lower half of his body. And he was in the uh, Legion of the Super Warner Friends. Brothers, you're thinking of Tasmanian Devil. Man, it was a guy, man. Uh, there were some interesting characters on there. If you think about it, I mean, we grew up in that, and then flash forward to a few years, and then all of a sudden they come on to you know from DC has this weird history where the, they come on other f- platforms, and then they get hot in their main DC continuity, like Harley Quinn, right, or like the Wonder Twins, right? You know, and people collect the first appearance of the Wonder Twins purely out of nostalgia, right, because they're kind of whack characters to begin with. But I think that's the way we see the DC animated films in a lens of pure nostalgia. I wonder if they're going to come to the CW, though. The Wonder Twins, I wonder if they're going to come to the CW if you watched the the season finale uh, or the uh, the finale of the Crisis crossover oh, yeah. and, and then the monkey from uh, yeah. Super Friends. Gleek. Yeah, Gleek. Gleek. Did yeah, that, people buying up comics. To that, right. to, yeah, that to me all wonder, it takes, bro. makes me wonder if you know, all it takes. I gave up on the CW stuff. I've been watching it since the beginning, but after the crisis, I liked Crisis, but after that, I just I couldn't do it anymore. And even more so now with the drama behind Batwoman, and then now we've got Elongated Man on Flash. Right. Arrow's nice. done. I haven't watched Legends of Tomorrow. It's too zany for me. I don't like the zany. Yeah, I, I haven't kept up with that one. And are you guys watching Star Girl? I watched the I watched the first episode. It was good. Yeah, Star Girl was good. Oh, we're losing you a little bit there, Zach. I said Titans is really the only one I'm sold on still. Mm. Star Girl. Yeah, but even Titans' budget is like, oof, man, it's hit or miss sometimes. In the Titans' original casting, it took me a while to like see the characters as the characters they were True. portraying. It took it took a minute. Um, a star girl, I think the benefit that it has is most of us aren't familiar with the character that much. So then, you know, when she kind of, the, the sh- I expected nothing from that show. And I, I sat and watched the first three episodes all together, was really kind of blown away um, by how good I felt like it was. I felt like it was kind of felt like Shazam, right? Where it had a little bit of humor. Um, it had, it had the graphically i thought like production wise it was it was really good and then when you've got guys like uh, uh you know luke wilson in it um mm-hmm. you, you're, you know, i think that he adds gravitas to the because you yeah. know you, you're used to seeing him in movies and then mm-hmm. you're like well are, does he need is he having problems paying the bills or why is he on the cw show What's right yeah him, him and him and joel McHale. um playing that's right yeah joel McHale too right yeah. right right off the bat uh you kind of sit back and go okay this is something a little different so um, it I'm felt I, very. I want to. I don't want to use it again, but very Spielberg Amblinish yeah. the way. I was that gonna say because right? it reminded me of, you know, nowadays kids are on YouTube and everything everywhere else. When I started watching it, I like paused it and grabbed my kids and to come and watch it because it basically reminded me of watching The Wonder Years growing up. And you know, it's one of those yeah. great family shows that you can all get together and watch mm-hmm. and not have to worry about. Uh, yeah, because you had the high school stuff, and the kid, I, at first I thought it was going to be kiddies, but you know there was some pretty good action in it too. So what, what I was afraid that Star Girl was, because you know how a lot of uh, the production companies, studios, what have you, they they invest a lot of money in the pilot, right? And yeah. then the quality drops down after that. So it's good to hear that it still uh, regains some quality after. So I'll go peep out see episodes uh, two and three, but I really liked uh, the first episode. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. It'd be interesting how they introduced the Justice Society into it though. Well, after three she starts, she makes the decision that she wants to rebuild the Justice Society. She grabs all those shits. So it looks like every episode going forward after three, it looks like they'll add one more Justice Society member, which means eventually we're going to get a Green Lantern right there on the show. 
like it, we're going to get a Dr. Fate. So like that thought has me very excited to see how that, that all that could play out now. Yeah. Cause we haven't seen them since Smallville, right? Right. By the right. last time we saw justice society. Yep. And I don't know or believe it will play out in the, as far as like comic speculation, but I find it very interesting that in their hall of justice, they're like justice society, um, hang out it's not called hall of justice i don't know what it's called but they they have like banners for each character the banners are the actual alex ross jsa covers from the nice. jsa run so I, I wonder if people won't make that connection won't recognize those covers if those covers couldn't become popular well hmm. i think um this is a pop i don't know if this is done on purpose or if it's done uh if it's a device that uh, warner brothers is using but because we all know that uh the rock it wants to bring the justice society this is a yes. good primer because these are probably characters that mainstream audiences do not know i yep. mean only hardcore comic fans know about Earth 2, Justice I like I love like when I was a kid, yeah. All Star Squadron, Justice Society, all those kind of weird one offs, man, our Legion of the Superheroes. I used to love those books. Think. And I was like, I used to like these characters. I didn't know who the hell they were, right? Justice, you know, I wanted more about the Justice Society and all these quirky characters. I love the Alan Scott version of Green Lantern because he mm -hmm. looked different, right? I mean, all these kind of old school characters. And I think that one Power Girl, or excuse me, Star Girl kind of introduces them and their kind of basic power set. But then if they do it right and The Rock brings in the Justice Society how he wants to, you're going to see full-blown adult version powered down, you know, and, and it's going to blow people's minds, hopefully. Right. Sometimes w, Warner Brothers doesn't see what one side of the uh, studio is doing to the TV side of the studio. So hopefully they are. Hopefully this is part of a master plan. Yeah, that, that, that was my initial thought was hopefully this is the – they're building the Justice Society that eventually we'll see in a future sequel, whether it's Shazam – Superman or a Black Adam feature within that storyline of those three films. Um, hopefully that's all going to play into it. Yeah, all I'm going to say, yo, those Golden Age books are going to pop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, and that's why I, that's why I look at those books and I say maybe that 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 Alex Ross run um, that Jason yeah, definitely. From, from like the mid-2000s, um, the one in ten incentives are cheap. The, the cover A's with that black cover and the, and the what isn't there a Jeff Johns run of Justice Society as well? That oh, was, yeah, it's uh, a great one too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually I think he wrote that run. I think he yeah, wrote yeah. that run and I think at Alex Ross did the covers. Yeah, I think there's a those are that's a great digging ground if you're gonna expect the the future of the DC and Justice Society. I, I mean, Manimal, we talked about it, right? We had a we had a long term spec for Justice Society and all the characters. Mm -hmm. Uh and yep. it was like it was like ten or fifteen of them um yeah. on our channel. So they're going full on with uh, what DC is planning on what they want to do with Justice Society. They eventually, they want to spin this out into their own solo film. Of, they don't want to do the Justice League for a while, but if The Rock really pops for his movie on, the, on Black Adam and Justice Society has good reception, the word was they want to make a Justice Society America film possibly with The Rock, but using these other characters and kind of letting Wonder Woman, Batman, and all those characters sit off to the side for a little bit, maybe down the road, JSA versus JLA, you know, but right now, give the society a shot. That's what I say. Let's I build these obscure characters that the mainstream audiences don't know and let them build a following. Mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned something right there, so I'm going to kind of piggyback off of it. Um, you know, we've talked about this a couple times throughout the course of uh, this discussion. We talked about long-term plays. Um, and I know that you guys are big advocates of that. Brian and I are big advocates of that. I think too many of the comic community is too short-term oriented. They yeah. want to flip the book from this week, uh, and they're not looking ahead. And the real ROI and the, and the, the long-term vets, the OGs in the game, we know, is with the long-term play. So you, we've been talking Justice Society. I would love to hear from each of you guys, TiVo, Manimal, what is one long-term play you can share with the audience right now that you've really got your eye on? So Zach? Yeah, I'll go first. I got a couple slabs right here. And, it's, and so it's not just one, but it's kind of all the same genre, if you will. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the long term play right now. And like you said, Jack, you and I both X-Men guys, you can play the X-Men game. If you don't have the X-Men books, don't talk to me anyway. First off, because I got nothing to say. To you. But what a snob. What a snob. I think, well, I just mean they're so awesome and superior yeah. to everyone else. But <laughs> I think the play is the thing we have never seen. We've seen a lot of the X-Men. We had whether you like the Fox stuff, you saw all those characters, and all you're going to be doing is rehashing the best ones. What we have not seen is Fantastic Four. And I think you get a double bang for your buck 
when you go up there, Fantastic Four, Silver, J Silver Age characters. So characters like Super Scroll, we've already seen the scroll show up, man. This is a big one. I got a couple of those guys. I think another great villain you got, Molecule Man, another Silver I Age. Sing. Fantastic Four. And then this isn't like a surprise to anyone, but a nihilist, man. So I think the best bet right now is bang for your buck. If you're trying to flip books and that's the game that you're playing, I think you want to go with the early Fantastic Four runs. Obviously stay away from the Galactus, the Silver Surfer, the Black Panther. All those have hit. You need to start hitting these smaller characters like the Super Scroll, the Molecule Man. Um, good luck getting the Mole Man. But, uh, you know, Doctor Doom, obviously. Good luck with that one as well. But Analysis is getting pretty pricey too, so. Yeah, but you still see, like you said, like Tim mentioned it earlier, you know, as well, Frankie Ray. There's other not Silver Age Fantastic Four characters that this is the breeding ground. And I think Fantastic Four, God, if you'd have asked me if I'd have said this like years ago, I, I probably would have said hell no. But I think Fantastic Four can provide a new arena for the Marvel Universe in terms of cosmic, the family aspect, the grounded superheroes. They bring all of it together. And man, if they cast Krasinski and if they cast his wife, Bro, I'm be. all in. Oh, it's got to be Krasinski. Yeah, because that's something they haven't really – they've done, like, little things about family is important, right? From Ant-Man and his daughter and, you know, you know, uh, Iron Con Tony Stark and his daughter. And so – but they haven't shown a full-blown – basically, The Incredibles, right? I mean, right. that's what – I mean, we always said Incredibles is the best Fantastic Four movie ever made. So, uh, my spec is a little bit different. Um, like, everybody knows, get the first appearance, get the first issue, get uh, – but I would say over the last two or three years, especially even more so now over the last six months, ever since uh, Marvel or Disney bought um, Fox and bought into Fantastic Four and more importantly, the X-Men and the giant library of characters of the X-Men, I've been specking, or at least my long-term play has been getting all the first time these characters have met because that's going to be huge when an MCU character meets what used to be a Fox property character or even a Sony character. So I've been specking... Um, let me see if I can remember it. It's the king size annual of Shang Chi. Is the first meeting of Iron Fist and Shang Chi. I've been specking um, Marvel super villains number thirteen and fourteen. God, it's the first meeting ever of Doctor Doom, and um, Need him. help me out. Need him. Doctor Doom and Magneto. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it, to think that Doctor Doom and uh, Magneto have never, ever met until the Bronze Age kind of blew my mind. I was like, wait a second. Yeah. This is the first time they met. So I really went researching, like, because that's not something you can really Google. Uh, the first meeting of Cyclops and, you know, you know, Vindicator, right? It's just, <laughs> you Google that, it's, you're going to have to search through a lot of stuff. So I did some searching, and then finally I was like, oh, this is the first appearance. It's, just, it's a super villain team of book. I think it's issue 13. It's the first meeting of Magneto and uh, Dr. Doom, and it's in the Bronze Age. Who would have thought that these characters have been around since the S Silver Age? I love that. They just didn't meet to the Bronze Age. Also a book I'm really high on that it's going to happen eventually is this book. Not, not the second series. I'm not specking evil uh, Miles Morales because I think that's false, whatever. I don't know who started that, but if anything, evil Miles Morales may show up in a video game, but this. This is the first, this is Spider-Man Volume 1, the miniseries, and this is Issue 2. Issue 1, Peter Parker, 616 Peter Parker and Miles Morales meet on one panel on the last page. But this one, they actually figure out who each other are. So when Miles Morales finally meets Peter Parker, it's going to be a monumental moment. Because, I mean, people don't understand, like, the, the Spider-Man, I mean, we're seeing it now. Spider-Man spec, if Spider-Man is done correctly, it bows up regardless of Spider-Man 2099, fucking Madam Web, come on, Jackpot? Have you are you kidding me? <laughs> Jackpot? Are you kidding me? So when you have an A-list character of Miles Morales meeting an A-list character of 616 Peter Parker, that's Spider-Man, Spider-Men book. And plus it's great cover by Jim Chung. But I think the first that's what I started doing because I figured a lot of times people get priced out of these first appearances, right? No, you know, Hulk 181. But why don't you go find the first time the Wolverine met so-and-so or this character? Because if you think about it, all of these characters in the MCU are finally going to meet up now. So, and, and, and all of us, we kind of understand how collectors think, right? They go, damn it, first appearance, second appearance. It's the first time they met. <laughs> right so then, then you know there's a whole premise of it it was called marvel team up guys there's a whole series from marvel that came out with these books called marvel team up when these characters met and so 
sometimes it's the first time an artist drew them, but a lot of times it's the first time they met. And, you know, it's, and it's, as we all know, every great super uh, hero meeting, they always fight first and then they come together and they beat up the bad guy together. And that's, you know, kind of been what I've been specking on. Obviously the, the stuff also, what Amanda was talking about, I'm pretty bullish on all the cosmic stuff. Just by every cosmic character there's out there because Marvel is going hard on supernatural and cosmic like, uh, like uh, Brian said earlier. Buy up all the supernatural characters, buy up all the cosmic characters, and you'll be set. If you buy everything, you won't miss out. Simple as How, that. How's that slapstick doing, Tim? Hey, man, slapstick will come sooner or later. <laughs> I, I bought, so a long time ago, uh, basically, this was a spec that was based on purely comic books, right? So Marvel had a kind of company-wide crossover where slapstick was going to be the main character. So I went and got first three first appearances of Slapstick for like 10 bucks for all three of them. And then people have not, not let me live it down. But at one point, that Slapstick number one was going for 20 bucks. And yeah, I, I, like I, that, what, three or four years ago, right? When Mercs for exactly. the Money came out. When Deadpool Mercs for the Money came out. I actually, exactly. I actually, I've been critical of the character of Deadpool before on the channel. And people get mad. Yeah, but I'm I just, with you. I just think, I think the character has potential, but they have never built a storyline that then al allowed the character to really kind of be fleshed out. The Evolve best, at all. Yeah. And the best I liked Deadpool was with the Mercs for money because it's like he built this team minded guys and they were working for him and it gave all of these D list characters a shot. And I said, that's a movie I would watch. I would watch him with Fool Killer and Slapstick. We are announcing it right now, world. guys. Go out and get Slapstick number one. It will appear right. on every number one top ten list next week. I guarantee it. Slapstick number one. If you want a copy, hit me up. I can give with the crossover with guys. the Hamburglar. Right. <laughs> yeah. But can you imagine like a Roger Rabbit type MCU film starring Slapstick fighting other evil comic book characters? I mean, it, it may not for the MCU, but man, a great little fun Disney thing on Plus. Disney+. Plus. Yeah, definitely. That also goes into kind of what I was speaking earlier about the spec stuff. You know, it, sometimes you take L's, man. Yeah. And sometimes you get big W's. And you shouldn't be mad and you shouldn't get upset when Tim told you to pick up Slapstick and you spent the money on it and it didn't work out. It may come. It may not. But, yo, it's fun, man. You picked up a just, few books. Here's, just, the best, here's the best part about it is how many L's become W's later? How many exactly. times have you felt like I took an L on this move and then it just it turns itself around? And Nihilus is one. I remember right. buying a Nihilus books seven, eight years ago, and then it didn't really turn out the way everybody thought it was going to go, and then sticking them in the long box, and then suddenly pulling them out two years ago and being like, holy shit, I can't believe what these are starting to move for, and now I'm sitting with copies because I took that out, because I, well, I was that early. Sometimes you just- I'll tell you- a W that might end up being an L, maybe not huge, but I think you might see a W that might end up being an L is Nova number one. So many people knew about it, snatched it up. When it comes time to flip that book, you think you're going to get above cover on your price because you're going to be competing with every Joe Blow out there who picked up 19 copies of this book. So you might have overpaid and you may not get that money back. Well, that's why I, it's important on, 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 I guess you call it popular spec uh, for lack of a better term is it's important to get it in a high grade. Cause that yes. will make your step away from everybody else. Right. When you say, Hey, I got this nine, six and it's a uh, newsstand of whatever, right. Uh, if you look at the newsstand of ultimate fallout four right now, I think is a ghost. I don't know who has it, but it's, you know, it comes up like once a year on eBay, if you can find it, good luck. But that is a ghost. You cannot find that thing. I didn't even know newsstands existed at that time, to be honest with you, but if, that's why, especially with the Nova, right? If you have an 8.5, if you have an 8.0, you know, spend the extra money as an investment and get 9.6 and 9.8. I mean, now that ship may have been, but you can probably find raw copies now and make sure you get something high grade because it's something that is spec heavily on or there is a large print run. You better make sure you got a high grade or else it'll just be in the wash with everybody else's. There's, a, high grades. there's a large dealer I follow on Instagram who just put a picture up today who found 20 raw copies of Nova number one. Great. Uh, that's who you're going to be competing with. In a warehouse, and they all look mint. And, yeah. that's, and that's the difficulty of that book. That book, She-Hulk number one, Miss Marvel number one, Star Wars number one. Um, you, you mentioned the Google Plus days. I remember back in the Google Plus days, it seemed like every six months, somebody made a warehouse find of a case of this book or a case of that book. Now, those days have started to, to, to dwindle. We don't see that too often anymore. But those memories still sit with me because I know how many near mint copies are out there. My long-term play is similar to what we've kind of talked about is actually, I'm going to take a cue kind of from what you 
did there, Tim, where you talked about characters meeting, um, I mentioned the eight, my belief about 80s and 90s nostalgia. I think the, the biggest, say, swing for the fences move you can make is betting on this Hasbro universe to work out, the All Spark Productions universe, because they are going to try to take properties like Transformers, G.I. Joe, Mask, and the craziest one, Power Rangers and try to create one shared universe with all of these, these characters. And it could go disastrous at how past movies have gone, but if it works, and if it works the way that it has the potential to work, and if, if, if you watch the Bumblebee movie, the Bumblebee movie tonally was different. Oh, that was great. But it was a great movie. Yeah. And, and if the, movie is, if the movies are done to that quality, um, I'm very bullish on it. People don't realize like G.I. Joe and Transformers had a crossover series in the 80s with Marvel. Mm -hmm. um, that number one issue, the first time those two properties meet, is a very unique, unique comic and, and one that will very directly play out on the big screen. We know it for a fact in the next five years or so. So I feel like that's one of those things where people just don't want to buy into that spec because they've never seen it play out before. And everybody wants something they've seen play out. So because they've never seen Transformers books pop to that level before on the secondary market. They've never seen G.I. Joe. They've never seen Power Rangers. They think it's not possible. But what I'm basing my belief on is the fact that the books that popped from the previous generation of movies, they were popped by the previous generation of comic buyers. Our generation is now in the prime buying seat right now as these next slate of movies come. And we all grew up on Transformers, G.I. Joe, Masters of the Universe, um, some of the younger people grew up on Power Rangers, and these are nostalgic uh, properties that I think the buy-in price, when you start talking about some of these books, is so ridiculously cheap in comparison to these fantastic four books that we're talking about and these X-Men books that I feel like if, if, this, if this franchise is done to the, to the quality that it could be done to, if it ends up bringing in a whole new generation of kids into all of these properties – and we already see it like at Walmart, right? How many Transformers book bags do you see and things like that? Um, if, if you can see a, a continuing proliferation of product into stores like that through this, this kind of collaborative movie um, process, I, I really think that you could see four, five, six time returns on a lot of these key issues yep. that haven't matriculated yet. I think in the past, people have never um, equated these properties with comic books. Because our generation, we grew up with them. They're toys or they're cartoons. By the way, you know, you did not know Marvel and DC licensed pretty much as much shit as they could in the 80s, right? I mean, if you think about that, the, the, we always talk about the secondary market for things that didn't happen in the comic books first. And the best example of that is what we're seeing right now in the spike of Star Wars characters that are getting super hot. Nobody ever said, oh, yeah, I'm going to get the comic of it. No, no, you enjoyed the films. And then all of a sudden you're like, did you know Ahsoka Tano appeared in the comics? This is her first appearance. Did you know, well, Kane and everybody knows that because Marvel had a miniseries, but then you go back to the Dark Horse stuff like Heir to the Empire yeah. number one. The that's Dark the first appearance of Thrawn and Mara Jade in that book. So I think, you know, once people, collectors like us or just collectors in general, because I think it's safe to say right now, the comic book collecting world is probably the largest it's ever been, right? I mean, yeah, yeah everybody is a collector now. Even if people who... That guy from Storage Wars, you know the the guy with the uh, the hot yep. chick. Uh, that guy. That guy. Transitioned yeah, that guy. His, yeah, he transitioned his entire business to comics. Purely comic books, and he's here. Yeah. He's gonna sweat and die in one of these storage units one day. I <laughs> swear to God, he is. But he is digging when those comic books stuff. Right. But his YouTube channel went to just like, and he's doing these huge buys, and he's showing all these books, and he knew nothing about collecting, and gradually starting to learn. He had CGC coming there and talking about it. So now you have these guys. And then us as seasoned, I don't want to, it sounds kind of, well, all right, fuck it. Okay. We're, we're seasoned collectors, right? right. And we see what's happening and people, they buy up, they go to the comic shop and every, every Wednesday, they don't buy one or two, they buy 10 copies of number one or what, you know what I mean? Right. And, but then us, we have to go, when people are going right, we have to go left, right? Everybody is going to be getting mm -hmm. the first appearance of Dr. Strange or whatever. Well, well you know, why don't I get the first appearance of this character or that character? When everybody is zigging, I like to zag. When everybody's trying to get the hot stuff, I say, you know what? Maybe they're forgetting about the first appearance of Kang 
uh, or the first appearance of the High Evolutionary, which I could probably get for cheap because everybody's buying Doctor Doom right now. So kind of look at the other way and you could probably get a better price. It's almost like uh, shopping off season for something, right? Yeah. If you buy a coat in the summertime, it's cheaper than if you buy it in the wintertime. So cheap all the time. That's your words of wisdom. Buy a coat in the summertime. <laughs> Kind of like what uh, talking about what you said, Jack, too, as well, just from a reader standpoint. Honestly, if you're a reader and not even a collector, if you are not reading Power Rangers or Go Go Power Rangers, you are doing yourself a disservice. Like, yes, those are great titles right now. And great stories lend into great movies and great TV shows and whatnot like that. And I was surprised by how much I loved both those series and I've read every single issue of them. And they're, yeah, they're I didn't grow up a Power Ranger fan. We've talked about me this neither. before, Brian yeah. and I. It kind of missed us. And then when we got into the comic series, it, it I was shocked at how adult it was and how right. I didn't feel like it, it was beneath me. And I felt like, and I also like the implementation of the new characters because Power Rangers is corny. Mm -hmm. That's the negative of it. Right. Bringing in Lord Draken and the Ranger Slayer gave it a more uh, adult, a, a more dire sense like the this is life and death now this is right. no longer just you know um that kind of cartoony fighting style so my whole bullishness on those properties is that i think hasbro because they're not just making comics with these characters they've already got toys out with these characters they've already done so much licensing with those two characters they're going to see these sales they're going to they've got to know that those two new characters have to be the center part of whatever those hardcovers are selling like crazy. crazy. You can't get them for good prices anymore. Right. I mean, so yeah, I and you're right. That I'm, movie has to be Draken centered. A hundred percent. I mean, the best character is the Green Ranger. Period. Yeah. So, and it's very much. It's awesome too. Like like you said, I kind of missed the boat. I was in that age group where Power Rangers was too kitty, but it still appealed a little bit to that side of me. Right. But so it's familiar with the way the story played out, and when the comics come in, they actually follow the show. Yep. Like they really do. Like when the original red, black, and yellow ranger leave, it explains where they went and what they were doing. And they upgrade that story and how they go into space and do a different ranger team and whatnot. And it really does follow and they reference back to the show, which what's popular right now, nothing more than shared universes. Everyone wants to shout outs back to the other stories you've read and they are knocking it out of the park. Yeah, but well, they make take the chance of making a power rangers more adult knowing what their their fan base you know what i mean because there's still a lot of kids that like really love power rangers you know and for the if they go too adult i mean that's what the comic books are there for right to give a, a more adult storytelling medium for something if something is like you know best example ever teenage mutant ninja turtles the first freaking uh, black and white comics were not made for kids right. at all whatsoever but then all of a sudden you had Cowabunga Pizza Turtles come and then boom, kids just loved it. But for the hardcore purists of Eastman and Laird, at the very beginning, it was dark, it was black and white, it was a huge magazine. It was, you know, it was not made rock. for kids. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It was I mean, not I, made for kids. I think they'll tone Draken down for sure. Yeah. But I, I think that they cannot do another film franchise with Rita Repulsa, with Goldar, no, it's with tough. These, you know, with these campy characters. Um because that's what got panned so hard last time. If they have a legit threat, if they have a Thanos in their universe, they ultimately can still win. The, the, the good guys can prevail. Um, and then again, the other element that comes into this is, how is the Transformers going to play out into this? How is G.I. Joe? Because they're trying to build this, this universe where you have your militaristic group, you have your cosmic aliens, um, you've got your kind of Power Rangers who can go between both sides. Isn't it masks too, or one of the? Mask, it's some yeah. acronym. Is it mask? Yeah. Mask. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Mobile Assault Strike Command or something like that. Uh, they, John Cena's character. I, I've said this. This is my biggest spec that I've gone on for years. John Cena's character is very clearly to me codenamed Raven from Mask, the leader of Mask. He, he flies in the plane. His his name is the same. Uh, his mannerism, his look is the same. He, it, John Cena would be the perfect casting for this character. So I think he's going to end up being the leader of Mask when they get into that portion of the franchise. So I think they well, already sowed those 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 uh, seeds in, uh, in in Bumblebee. Well, hopefully they 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 take the Marvel approach and not the DC approach and rush it right it, to tell an expand expanded universe. It takes time. You need each property, One each time. intellectual property, to have its own kind of origin and then slowly blend it in. And we saw 
I don't know if I could use this. I'm a Justice League, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it just if they, each character would have had their own film, their own development, or even a, you know, they were in movies together, it would have melded better. Yeah. You can take time. I think they were so adamant that they didn't want to be like Marvel that they did right. it that way. Oh, yeah. To the learned. point where they were being stubborn. No, we're DC. We've been, you know, we're the distinguished competition and this and that. And then Feige's like, you know what? Here, take this Ant-Man Part 2 movie and take it. And well, you're going to like it. I think a uh, them starting with a Snake Eyes Storm Shadow origin movie that will yeah. be largely Kung Fu based um, and it will be more about their, their growing up with the clan and the battle over kind of being the leader and Storm Shadow going bad and, and Snake Eyes joining the Joes. I think that will allow you to kind of start in a very G.I. Joe-centric world. And then hopefully they can use some of the tricks Marvel used with post-credit scenes and little, you know, Easter eggs and teasers. I agree with you. Don't throw it all together in, in the beginning bring this in very, very, very slowly and allow this to develop. If they do it right, I think there's, there's so much to be made in that area because, again, these comics have been ignored. And you're spot on with the Star Wars comparison because we were making that same argument about Star Wars a year ago, and our content about Star Wars wasn't getting traction. Uh, we, were, we kept saying, I don't understand why these characters' first appearances aren't worth anything. And people weren't on board and then Mandalorian hit yep. Mandalorian it, changed it, the game. It needed yeah. a platform. It needed something like Disney Plus to say, all right, oh wow, Disney Plus is no joke, right? So you know right. if something the quality of the Mandalorian can be made to make Kanan or Thrawn or Mara Jade or any of these characters in the I guess Dr. you want to call it the, the expanded universe, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's interesting because when back to G.I. Joe, like I actually liked Storm Shadow and G.I. Joe in the last film, right? Yeah. The, you know, I thought that was some pretty cool shit, you know, but then they kind of changed. I remember, yeah, Ch Ch Chase uh, Tatum, Tatum. Channum mm -hmm. Tatum, right up here, died in like the first 10 minutes, spoiler alert. But right. anyway, I mean, there, that's why growing up watching it, I remember like, you know, G.I. Joe was like the after school cartoon. You came home from school and then you watched it because it was a little bit adult, right? You can't just have planes blowing up at eight in the morning, I guess. You have to watch it after school. But there's so much history there. Uh, there's so many characters that they could build from, but they need to take their time. I mean, yeah. they, I thought the first film, there was like, they were, it was okay. The second film, they just totally threw it out the window. And then The Rock was in there for some odd reason. Channum Tatum wasn't in there and you wanted to hear the characters names that you used to you the toys that you played with you want to hear those characters names being used on the big screen right and but you just didn't get it i mean so they, they got to take their time with it you know just like we're going to say like gi joe number one is that going to blow up again you know uh and when they did it is the idw version going to blow up there's new characters in the id isn't gi joe's daughter in the idw version yeah well that's my whole thing is a that's one of the things we talked about this week on our snake top eyes 10. daughter excuse me yes yeah, one of the things we talked about in our top 10 is dawn moreno the you know the new hispanic snake eyes female who yeah. she has his subconscious you know she has him his consciousness in her subconscious so she can actually like he can speak to her um and that character has reinvigorated the comics um, it's it's kind of ignited the fan base. I, I think they would almost be foolish to not get some of that X twenty three Spider Gwen sort of heat within uh, the GI Joe universe. By I'd bring her in almost immediately. Start telling that story slowly. Bring her in, similar to what we're talking about with Amadeus, where you bring her in and you just you meet her as Dawn Moreno, and you just you under you understand that she's like they did Black Widow in MCU, right? Yep. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, bring her in. Bring her in. She can be herself. She can be a, a, a ninja studying, and then an apprentice, and then also develop into Snake Eyes down the road. And I think that that would be that would be genius. But you know, it, it, they've got a lot at stake. I think this is probably the last time they can really try to reboot this whole thing and get people on board for a while. So this is going to be big. And then integrating Power Rangers seems to be this non-organic thing that could either be extremely awesome or uh, out of this world weird and I think it's only a matter of time before we see the publishing side catch up I'm waiting for Boom Studios and IDW to get together on a collaboration it's only a matter of time before we see that like we didn't even talk about ROM dude how do, you, right. how do we not yeah, talk Rom, about ROM Rom, ROM's what? absolutely well you've absolutely. been seeing the, the Power Rangers Ninja Turtle storyline is actually one of the most popular ones right now that great. Was. it was a great book and yeah. I would love to see Power Rangers and Transformers do a, a crossover like that um, start sowing those seeds. Well, hopefully the studio uses 
um, the comic books as source material because they may, uh, hopefully there, it's not some studio head is, is, is go look at some of the old movies and cartoons and let's pull stories mm -hmm. from there where, you know, somebody sitting there, dude, I have like 20 years worth of comics here that we could pull stories from, you know? And so it's not like, you know, Captain Kennedy saying we have no source material, but uh, right. yeah, there's a yeah. whole expanding like hundreds of thousands of, of books, books and right. comics that you could pull from video games. Yeah. The beauty of all spark productions is they set it up like the MCU where it's an independent movie company that so Hasbro has their own independent movie company that's then distributed uh, by I believe Paramount. Paramount, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they have their I, they will they on the outset of it they should have less Paramount influence than so it's all about Hasbro. Do they really know what makes their character sell? Do they really know what people want to see? But, so that's why I said my hope with Draken and Ranger Slayer is if they pay attention to those Lightning series Hasbro action figure sales and see like, oh, those are the two most popular action figures. Therefore, we got to get those characters in the movie. Not that there's going to be a next episode, but if we ever do this again, I think we should talk about, um, <laughs> I'd like to talk about um, things that weren't originally created in comic books, but as another way of specking. And when I say that is I'm talking about um, horror and universal monsters and how if they come out with, a werewolf movie, well, the Wolfman movie, or the Frankenstein movie, and how their characters first appeared in the MCU, people were like, maybe I should buy this comic. No, it's why not? You know, it's it's specking, even though it's not MCU making the character, but somebody else's. I always find that interesting on why or why shouldn't or why should somebody buy it? And I'm like, why not? Frankenstein, Dracula, obviously Marvel's going to have their own version, but, you know, nobody's ever gone out and said, yo, I need to get that first Anne Rice novel about, you know, all this stuff. You know what I mean? It's like right. nobody ever says that, but comic books are just like a totally different creature. Really, it allows you to kind of collect any way you want. Like, you know, hey, I'm buying this because they're making this movie. Yeah. There's, I bought the Macross comic because they're making a Macross movie, but nobody remembers the Macross comic. Everybody remembers the Macross uh, animated movie, uh, cartoon, or well, movies as well as the cartoons. But, you know, I got the book because I was like, this is cool. And guess what? Other people started buying it. And I was like, wow, this thing is kind of expensive. I better make sure I grab a high-grade copy now while I can. Because you don't ever – it's kind of like ancillary spec. Macross has nothing to do with comic books. But comic collectors who like both are going to be like, hey, let me just see where this comic is at because I know they made a comic. The Crow is another good example of that, right? Not any big publisher, but really hard to – hard to find and made a few movies and then it became a cult classic and people like want to find that first appearance of the yep. crow it's just interesting how we as collectors now most collectors growing up have somewhat disposable income so they, they just see something like i'm gonna get that how much okay put on my credit card i'll worry about the, the bills later right <laughs> yeah i think miles I think morales I'll, right now i can't afford right. the books so those are going for <laughs> that's yeah, crazy i, I, I didn't think, I, think such a high print run will get that high I think you're spot on with like those type of characters. I've seen the same with Hellraiser with the HBO. Oh yeah. HBO, and then uh, Ghostbusters with real Ghostbusters. Number one um, has seen spikes since the Ghostbusters trailer. Kind of came it's, out. it's there, dude. If there is a property that's been around for a while, you're a pretty safe bet. There's a damn comic book on it. You know, yeah, right. I don't even talk just, about, I don't even talk about tops comics yet and all the weird properties there. Remember tops oh, comics had oh, yeah. really Zorro, weird properties? Had American Zorro. mythology. <laughs> like, yes. Oh my God. Dude, I had a man from Atlantis comic. That's how old I am. Okay. <laughs> Nobody remembers the man from Atlantis. Okay. He was before Aquaman. Uh, TV right? show. <laughs> no, it was man from Atlantis. It was the dude from uh, Dallas was on that. Remember? Uh, Patrick Duffy. Google it, kids. He had, he had webbed feet, and he could swim underwater really fast. He was named the man from Atlantis. That was the closest thing in the 70s we had to, to a superhero show. The man from Atlantis. Ah, I'm gonna go, actually, I'm going to go find that now. <laughs> so this has been an exciting episode. This was one, when we set up this podcast, we earmarked certain other tag team duos out there in the YouTube comic universe that we wanted to get inside the ring with and work with, and this was one of those teams, and this was an exciting episode. I hope you guys got a lot of information. TiVo, Manimal, thank you so much. Now, we would love to know, before we let you guys go, let all the people out there in the Simpleman's Comics YouTube community know what you guys got going on, what you're going to be getting involved with, where they can find you, so on and so forth. Manimal, we'll start with you, my man. Yeah, so I'll keep it kind of general. I know Tim will... Um hit the finer points here, but obviously Tim and I on Lords of the Long Box, we got shows typically every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every once in a while on auction here and there and some random stuff that we do. Um, one of our big 
partnerships that I'm, I'm really proud of and really excited about every week is the coverprice.com top 10, where preface this by saying this isn't go buy these spec books. This is actually reporting on books that have been purchased and spikes in sales. So actually exact data, not speculation. So it's fun and it's fun to see random old books pop up. You never know what's gonna happen. A lot of times I like to, I probably shouldn't say this in front of Tim, I like to wait right before the show and look at the list. <laughs> so that, yeah. I love the cover price stuff. Side note too, check out their uh, website, www.coverprice.com. It's cover without the E. Very great tool if you are a collector. So many ways to use it. So I'll turn it over to Tim. Yeah, before I let Tim go, we'll definitely want to note that we are big Cover Price fans. Shout out to Cover Price founder, Matt DeVoe, who is uh, actually a former podcast member of Brian's from the old school Tales from the Flipside podcast. Those two uh, work together. So we're big Cover Price fans. And we like what you guys are doing over there with the Cover Price. Yeah, and we'll put a link to... He just announced the URL, but we'll put the link to cover price in the description of this video as well. Yeah. So yeah, every Tuesday we at 6 p.m. Pacific, we do cover price top 10. We cover the basic, we do it on a Tuesday because we cover sales data going all the way from the previous week up to Sunday. So basically this is data that's compiled from four different websites that the engineers over coverprice.com use. So this way you get an idea of what people are buying and we only, we give you our analysis on it. And we'll also tell you if it's really, why it's really moving, if it's accurate or not, or sometimes there's just People are just buying up books for no reason at all. So, you know, and then Wednesdays we have a live show where we also talk about the spec that we're hearing from our man, Mikey Sutton, and sometimes Black Knight, and we get a long-term spec list. And we go over those. And then Thursday is a mailbag show every day, by the way. For some reason, it's a 6 p.m. Pacific. I don't know why, but it works out that way. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Thursday is the mailbag show where Mikey will answer questions. Any questions you have about the MCU or DCEU, and we go over those things. Also, follow us on uh Manimal on Instagram, myself on Instagram. We post comic books and stuff. I try to do comic book calls whenever I get a chance. Basically, I do comic book calls when my room is just littered with uh, comics all over the floor. And that is right now. I got about 70 books I need to show. So I'm probably going to do a comic call video. And to be honest with, uh, with you guys, with Brian and Jack, we probably could have done this for another two hours, man. There's just so oh, much yeah. that we could talk about. But uh, I would love to be back on your show or you guys come back on our show. You know, we can go back and forth. And, you know, yes. I, I'm pretty sure we could chop it up for hours at a time, bro. Yeah, yeah definitely do the whole college football home and home. <laughs> come on ours, we'll, then we'll come on your channel. I want to also thank you guys for coming on here. It was a, it was a privilege. We were talking about we've talked through dms we've talked through facebook messenger um we've been trying to get this scheduled and i'm glad we finally did and like you said we could have talked for a few more hours i kind of had to come and say hey i think we got to kind of close this down (laughs) yeah it's only supposed to be an hour but we're pushing two hours now yeah right but it's great because that's what this is this is the audio version podcast we have the video but it's intended for that flagship podcast for you to listen to on the commute when you're working out when you're just trying to drown out the kids because everyone's sick of being at home all the time. But either way, thanks to Zach. Thanks to Tim. We appreciate you guys coming on. We will put links to all their social in the description of this video. And with that being said, guys, this is Brian and Jack. So, Man's Comics and Friends, we'll see you guys in the next episode.